Hello, everybody. My name is Jenna. I'm the Program and Outreach Manager for the Headwater Science Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today for our live panel discussion with the cast of Chasing Coral. So before we begin, I just do want to remind you that we are a nonprofit and we do have a back to school fundraiser going on. So if you would like to help us and participate in that, we will link the information in the bio and I will have a banner streaming later on in this preview. So while we get started, I'm going to welcome Phil Dustin, one of the stars of Staging Coral, as well as a scientist that manages all of this information. So welcome, Phil. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Phil Dustin. I'm a coral scientist. I'm also a professor at the College of Charleston. I've been studying coral since 1969, so that's a long time. And during my lifetime, I've actually watched the reefs disappear. Um, I've, when I started working in the Florida Keys, um, the corals were beautiful, they were luxurious, and they've lost about 98% of their live coral since that time. I met Jeff and Richard in the Florida Keys when they were just beginning on um, sort of the idea of chasing coral. And they wanted to see the area that I'd worked in because of the photographs that I've published about the reefs. So we went out there and um, they didn't realize what was really going on. It was sort of fun to take them out there and show them. And all of a sudden, just as they, Jeff says in the movie, Richard says, it was like, boom, a light bulb turned on. They went, oh yes, now we know what's problem is. And they got really involved in it. And um, I've been working with them ever since. Um, I now work in a place called Raja Ampat, which is in the very center of the Coral Triangle, which is a, a fascinating place too. It's essentially the Adam Hart mother of, of marine biodiversity um, on the planet. So that's fun also. And there the corals are still really happy and luxuriant, but tourism is getting into them. So we'll talk about that later. Great. So we also want to welcome M.G. Hall. She works with Exposure Labs and she manages her climate change initiative. So M.G., can you just go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me, Jen. Um, so excited to be here, especially with you, Phil. It's really cool to be on this panel together. Um, so I'm M.G. I studied ecology in college and I did some coral research with um, and my, my advisor was Jim Porter, who's also in Chasing Coral. So I've been sort of connected since I was in school. Um, and then I realized I didn't really think that being a researcher was for me, but I wanted to figure out how I could best serve this movement. So um, I like people. I'm good with people. I enjoy talking to people and um, communication stuff. So I started working with Exposure Labs as an intern um, and then turned into a full-time job. So I, as Jen said, work with our climate program um, and I am the climate impact coordinator and work with um, two other folks on the team to manage our climate program, which has kind of turned into something bigger than just Chasing Coral, but Chasing Coral is sort of the heart of it all. So yeah, excited to be here. Great, well, thank you both so much. So I do want to let our audience know that you can ask questions at any time. We do have many opportunities for you to ask our panel of experts questions. Um, so to kick things off, we are going to introduce Kenzie Horton. Um, so Kenzie, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself and you can ask our experts some questions. Hey, so hi, I'm Kenzie. I'm a grad student at Jacksonville University. Um, I'm also a fisheries biologist, so I'm really excited to hear about, um, you know, your work and your perspectives on the, the documentary and everything. Um, so my first question is, do you have to really be a marine biologist or in the biology field to um, be a part of restoration projects and conservation of corals? I could jump in and then Phil, if you have anything to add, I can sure. ask I, I, you. I'm sorry, I missed the last half of that question. My, my, I live in the country and my internet isn't always all that good, but um, go ahead. So the yeah, the question was just like, what is, uh, do you have to really be in the marine biology or the biology field to be a part of the coral restoration projects and management, or can you be in other fields um, to help to help out as well? MG, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I kind of am like living proof that the answer is no. Um, I love coral and I was really passionate about ecology. I'm still really passionate about ecology. Um, and I've always been into science my whole life. But like I was saying earlier, I realized that like, I don't think 
that being a lab scientist would be my strongest, it's not my strongest skill. And so I like to tell people to lean into what you're best at and figure out where that's needed in the movement, in the climate movement, and then um, specifically with corals too, and, and any sort of um, activism, there's a place for everyone and there's a place for every field. So, you know, let's say that you are, you work in finance and you've never, you know, you're not a scientist, you're not a science person. Um, but even people who work in finance are going to be impacted by climate change, are being impacted by climate change, are being impacted by the loss of corals and by a loss of biodiversity. So everyone, we kind of need people that aren't in science to be involved in this just as much as we need scientists. Um, Cause everyone brings a unique perspective and a unique skill set, And without everyone helping out, there's no way we can, we can solve this problem. Sure. I'd, I'd, I'd like to add that the ocean begins at your front door. <clears throat> Virtually everything you drop on the ground eventually finds its way into the ocean somehow. And the problem we see with reefs isn't simply climate change. It's what we're doing to the oceans and we're essentially killing the oceans and reefs are the most fragile piece of that. So we're seeing them disappear first. <clears throat> so they're really like the canary in the cage, truly. And, um, as MG was saying, there's all kinds of things to do because it, it deals with shipping, it deals with finance, it deals with sewerage. Um, one of the biggest killers of, of coral reefs is sewerage. Um, Florida Keys and the Florida Megalopolis, 600 million gallons of treated sewerage a day go offshore. So, you know, there's an awful lot of things to do, not just deal with carbon. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I really liked how kind of the documentary kind of showcased kind of different disciplines as well. And it kind of that's what kind of got me uh, thinking about this question, seeing engineers and hobbyists and everything kind of come together to create this documentary. Um, and then my second question is, what is um, the difference between the thermal stress on the corals and ocean acidification and why the thermal stress is more of a greater impact currently? So both of them have to deal with um, the process of calcification and the process of nutrition for corals. Corals have living in their tissue, as, as Chasing Coral shows, symbiotic algae called zooxanthellae. <clears throat> and the zooxanthellae do two things, okay? They, um, they basically help the coral grow faster by, um, by altering the pH inside the, the coral skeleton and helping the deposition of calcium carbonate. So that's pH sensitive. And then they also feed the coral um, various kinds of nutrition. They give them glycerol and some other amino acids and, and, um, and a variety of high energy compounds. <clears throat> when the temperature gets too high, what happens is the algae start to over photosynthesize. They get revved up and they begin to produce so much oxygen that it becomes toxic. And corals do produce enzymes that protect them from that. But if it's just too much, the coral says, hey, you know, I love you. I want to be with you, but get out of here because you're toxic. And so the, the relationship becomes dissolved. Not entirely, but mostly. If the temperature gets hotter, then we begin to get beyond the thermal tolerance of both the animal and the plant, and they both die. So both of these are coming at the same thing, but from different ends. And Basically, ocean acidification is a product of having too much CO2 in the atmosphere because it dissolves into the ocean. Yeah, I think Phil covered it pretty well. I don't really have much to add. <laughs> awesome. Um, kind of just a slightly follow-up part to that. Um, I've read a few papers. I believe they were from, if I can find it, Baker and Silverstein and Clark that that we're looking at the change in zooxanthellae from the two different clades. I believe C to D are more heat tolerant one. Um, is there any difference between how they're able to withstand some of these thermal stresses, adding, you know, or gaining, uh, taking more of these thermal tolerant zooxanthellae? So some of the clades, and, and I forget which one, I think it might be D, is probably an invasive clade. It's invading the Caribbean. And when it interacts with the zooxanthellae, it's not as efficient a host, um, a, a symbiont inside. <clears throat> so there's some issues that go on there. But many corals have more than one kind of zooxanthellae living in their, in their, inside their tissues. 
And so they can almost garden. You can think of it at different times of year. It's like it's a little warm, so let's bring this genotype up. And, and it's a little cool, now we'll bring this genotype up. And we'll, and we'll sort of be an internal gardener as well as an external gardener. Corals can also um, pick up zooxanthellae from the neighboring environment. So if a coral settles in a place and there is a better zooxanthellae, it may pick it up and then culture it inside its tissues. They're, they're pretty good at this. You know, they, they've been around for 220 million years or so. So they're pretty good at this. But for example, we have a coral in, off Charleston that bleaches. And when it bleaches, it, it's only like 82 degrees Fahrenheit when it bleaches. It's, it's very low. And you say, well, why doesn't it get a zooxanthellae that's more adapted to a higher temperature? In the winter time, the temperatures drop here into the 40s. So it has to be a zooxanthellae that can live in the warm temperature as well as the cold temperature. And this is why we'll never see the tropics invading the temperate zone because the, of the upwellings you get in wintertime storms and the seasonality. And then I just have one final question. Um, do you guys have any uh, insight on some of the cultural impacts that the loss of coral has on um, different um, communities around the world? You know, the Hawaiian Islands, you know, the, the, the corals are an integral part of their community and their culture, as well as many other communities globally. Um, what are the potential impacts of the loss of these coral and at this rapid of a rate as they're, we are losing them? MG, you want to start on that? Yeah, and this I'll is pick huge. It, and, <laughs> it is. It's massive. It's the the impacts go so much further than you would think. Because I think uh, you you said it perfectly, Phil, that the ocean starts at your front door. So no matter where you live, you are connected to it in some way. And it's really easy when you don't see it. It's like they say in the film too that it's you know kind of out of sight, out of mind. When in reality, the the loss of corals is impacting everyone. So like. I, th I believe, and again, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe about a fourth of marine life relies on corals at some point in their life cycle. And then over 500 million people worldwide, if not more, probably definitely more, um, rely on corals either for income, for protein, for food, um, or for just like the way they live their life. And that's that's not even necessarily to mention the island nations um, and places that rely on coral as such a huge part of their tourism. And so their economy is really tourism based. It's really heavily based on ecotourism, which is, you know, going to to look at the environment, the whole kind of like appeal of a place. So if the whole appeal, the whole appeal is is the environment and that goes away, then the economy starts to topple in those nations. Not to mention also just the cultural significance of corals to some communities, like you were saying in Hawaii, it's hugely significant, not only for their economy, but to the native people of Hawaii. And it's it's financially a huge impact, a huge deal. I think Coral brings in over $3 billion of revenue just in the US every year. And that's obviously a huge amount of money. So financially a huge impact. It's also just sad because I love coral. I know Phil, you love coral too. And most of us on this call, I think are, are pretty into it. Um, so it's just sad to see it going. All the, the creatures that rely on it are not gonna have a place to live anymore. There's not gonna be, some animals use corals as nurseries like to, to raise young and that's not gonna exist anymore. So they're gonna have to move somewhere else. Communities that have been fishing based like villages all over the world, coastal villages that have been fishing based. There's, you know, generations, best generations of folks who that's that's all they've done. That's their culture, it's their family. Um, that's not gonna be a possibility anymore. And it's already starting to happen. That's climate migration is a huge thing. So people are having to flee where they've historically had abundance, then they now have um, scarcity and they have to go somewhere else. And that's, you know, imagine having to leave your home because you can no longer live a functional life um, because of uh, something. And often those communities who have to flee are some of the folks who are um, least contributing to the problem. Um, and they're the ones who are suffering the most, so. Yeah, well said. Um, there's another aspect to this that we don't really talk about too much. It's called environmental security. And for example, <clears throat> when the food chain collapses in Haiti, all the Haitians get in their boats and they paddle somewhere else, just to use them as, you know, an example. But <clears throat> this is going ar on around the world. So you're seeing all kinds of interesting aspects of environmental security in different nations when their food webs collapse. And um, it goes on and on and on. Um, one of the problems with tourism is, and people don't really think about this, is Yes, tourism is supposedly a clean 
industry, but when you get tourists coming to a place, they bring money, and that's what we call the blue economy, but they also bring with them a huge supply chain of all kinds of other things, and they leave very high protein waste. And if that wastewater isn't dealt with appropriately, and, and it's not virtually anywhere in the world, what that does is it goes into the reef and it begins to kill the reefs through fertilizing the reefs. And when you fertilize the reefs, the corals grow like crazy because coral reefs are most luxuriant in places where there are no, very little nutrients, lots of light, very little sediment, um, and lots of fish that are herbivores and, and carnivores. And when you over fertilize it, basically with human waste, what happens is the corals grow like crazy. Their zooxanthellae go nuts, but they have nitrogen in the waste, but not enough phosphate. So they scavenge sulfur to build their membranes as they grow. And that makes them more susceptible to bleaching through thermal bleaching. So for example, in, in, in chasing coral in the Great Barrier Reef, it, estimates suggest that about half of that bleaching and mortality was due to nutrification. About half of that. So that's the idea of building resilience by going back and trying to fix everything else. If you can go back and put the environment back, that's fine. Um, and, and that's what we need to do first. We need to realize that if these reefs grow in a particular kind of environment, and that's what you want to restore. So when we talk about restoring reefs, what we need to do is restore water quality first, and then we can think about planting corals back. Yeah, I also wanted to add quickly that there's, so we were talking before this call about um, the hurricane that recently went through, there was a hurricane that went through um, Puerto Rico, and there was also the hurricane that impacted Florida. And one of the things that people don't think about, and I didn't know for a long time, is that coral reefs are actually really great at breaking, at dissipating wave energy. So when there's like a storm surge coming through, the waves will become smaller if there's a healthy, happy, big coral reef. Um, there was actually a study done by Stanford, I believe, um, in like 2014, said the um, coral reefs can help dissipate wave energy by up to 97%, which is massive. Um, and I mean, I think that speaks for itself. If there's a 10 foot storm surge coming in and there's a reef that can break it down, that's houses and lives saved by the reef just existing. So. Yeah, some of that original work was done on Bikini Atoll when we were exploring Bikini to see if we could blow it up with an atom bomb. They wanted to find out if it was stable. Oh, yeah. And, and Walter Monk went there and did a study. Um, they, they looked at the dissipation of energy by the spur and groove system on those coral reefs. And they talked about if that, if that wave energy wasn't dissipated that way, the water inside the lagoon would be something like 60 meters high. So it, they take out a tremendous amount of that. And wave protection is very important. Um, on Christmas Day, and I think it was 2000 in Aceh, a province in northern Indonesia, there were a quarter of a million people were killed by a tsunami. And the places that had taken out the mangroves and bombed the reefs were damaged most by the tsunami. And the other places were, they weren't totally spared, but they were spared a lot, a lot less. Yeah, that's probably their biggest function, if we think of as, as um, help them in. It's probably the biggest thing they do is they sort of break waves and, and dissipate wave energy. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I, the, the barrier between some of the storms and waves is something I think you know, I recently have just learned about, and I tend to, you know, forget that how important that is. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and that's all and the that's, questions I have, and I, oh. Let me, let me add, as reefs die, what happens is that three-dimensional structure disappears, and they become flattened. And then <clears throat> the waves just roll through. So, um it's a it's a whole process and it's actually been people have been studying it and talking about it and 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 as the reef loses its three-dimensionality and its rugosity it there are no places for fish and there are no way to break the waves do you think that affects erosion along coastlines totally totally awesome. well well thank you guys so much those are all the questions that i have um i really appreciate you guys taking the time to answer all those yeah sure. thank you Good questions. Thank you, Kenzie. So we did have a question in the chat. Um, did the coastal ecosystem services alter as the corals disappeared from the coastline? Absolutely. 
as corals begin to disappear, fisheries disappear, wave energy dissipation disappears, um, sand production disappears. Um, people don't think about it, but reefs are giant sand factories. <clears throat> and because um, so much of the um, so much of the of the algae and the animals are cal are calcareous, so their skeletons make sand. And um, parrotfish, you know, like to chew on coral rock, and they poop out really fine sand. So you lose your sand, you lose your beaches, um, you get much more beach erosion occurring. Um, yeah, all kinds of things happen. Do you want to add anything to that, or is that? <laughs> I mean, I, you're covering you're, you're covering it very well. I, the only thing I would add is just another plus one to the the mangroves comment you made earlier, Phil. That like mangroves are also massively important to coastal ecosystems, and a lot of places where mangroves are found, there are also corals. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that may, they're a super cool tree, like a really cool plant. They essentially like live floating. And I like, well, I remember when I learned about those when I was doing my research in college. I was just like, this is insane. Um, but they also provide a ton of ecosystem support um, that, that benefits humans massively as well. And they don't get a lot of credit either. So just plug for the mangroves too. <laughs> sure. And, you know, we, we think in terms of coral reefs as resources. Mm. It's a resource. And a coral reef really is the sort of the culmination of all the interactions of all the organisms that live on it that have evolved there for the last 200 million years. <clears throat> and they are really the greatest expressions of life in the ocean. Um, there are more different kinds of animals and plants that use coral reefs than you'll find in a rainforest. Rainforests may have more species, but it's mostly insects and some, uh, some vertebrates and, and, and plants. But when you begin to look at the different kinds of phyla, the higher orders of, of animals and, and plants that, you, that occur, I think it's um, 32 out of 34 known phyla touch reefs sometime during their life cycle. So when we lose a little piece of the ocean like that, you think of like, um, well, look, let's take a human being. We have a bunch of organs that do things. And, you know, if, if we lose our lungs, maybe we're lucky we can get a, a lung transplant. But if we lose the forests, we might miss that. Um, if we lose a kidney, if we lose this, if we lose that, all these different ecosystems that we think of are sort of different parts of this one large ecosystem called the biosphere and we need all of them. Um, it's not just the goods and services to humans, it's it's making the world right for life and, and a suitable place for us all to live. Oh, that's perfect. And that, and that came from our friends at uh, Wesley Labs, like they're very big in all the ocean research. So I was excited to hear from them. So. With that, we're going to go ahead and bring in one of our board members, Shandon. Um, she has some really awesome questions for you guys. So I'm going to let Shandon introduce herself a little bit about why she is wanting to be involved in this. So welcome, Shandon. Hi there. So um, I have a background, uh, educational background in water resources um, and just a commitment to environmental education and science education and uh, using that as a way to sort of change perceptions of the environment and increase critical thinking among the next generations. So in a hope to reverse course here. Um, related to what we were talking about, this is quite, this is a question that um, just came up as we were discussing things and that with the reefs, um, dying off and no longer creating a block for wave energy. Are we seeing saltwater intrusion uh, into freshwater resources, mm -hmm. in the freshwater water table uh, in, in these coastal areas? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know how you would measure that on top of sea level rise. Because sea level rise is obviously the, the biggest event that's going on with, with respect to interacting with the water table. Most of the places where they're reefs, um, the shoreline is a carbonate, it's like Swiss cheese shoreline. So, for example, um, when you go to the Bahamas or when you go to um, in almost any Caribbean island, you walk on what they call iron shore, which is about <clears throat> six or eight or ten feet above sea level. 
and um, it's this rock that you see, and and, um, and that's earlier coral reefs that were formed about a hundred thousand years ago, and it's like Swiss cheese. For example, in Raja Ampat, when it rains, there, there's no fresh water on on these islands, and they might be 20, 30, 40 acres, 50 acres. There's almost no fresh water because the <clears throat> It's so porous that there's no there's no chance for a really good freshwater lens to develop. So if you take away the reefs from the outside, like a barrier reef, I'm sure it would impact the wave energy pushing water into that sort of um, freshwater lens, and it would probably impact it. But yeah. I don't know how much how it would how you'd measure it. I, I'm not quite sure how you would actually do that study mm -hmm. yeah. and demonstrate it. Um, another kind of related question um, was about uh, desalinization and the effluent from the desal plants. Have you guys seen um, uh, how the coral is affected by that? Have there been any locations where you have a desal plant close to coral? Not that I know of, but I'm sure if you put hot brine back into the water, it's going to kill things. Yeah. You know, if you increase the salinity and you change that, I, I'm I'm sure you'll have an impact on that. I mean, I have these are all very California related kind of questions. <laughs> sure. sure, you got to realize California is the leading edge of our continent, so you have these sharp, you know, these sharp drop offs in these submarine canyons. Okay, um, reefs are are built on a different kind of geography, right. if you will. But there are places where they are starting to, you know, go after desalinization. I mean, places like the Bahamas have used desal plants for years. And I'm sure there's an impact if that effluent from the desal plant is put right in one place because reefs are, reefs have evolved in relatively um, within narrow tolerances of salinity and temperature and light and nutrients so when you push the environment away from that quickly um, it's difficult for them to live in those habitats um along the lines of of sort of my original questions that i had after watching the movie um they're more based less on pollutants and more on temperature and if the temperature was to return um two degrees back to where the coral can can comfortably thrive um, in an area where a lot of the coral has been decimated, would it come back? Can it regrow? That's an excellent question. <clears throat> and it has a really good modern um, perspective. Right now, there's an effort to plant corals in the Florida Keys. Okay. And the effort is we're going to, we're going to, first of all, genetically engineered the toughest corals we can we're going to put them out in the florida keys and we're going to restore the florida keys and it's a great way to spend a hundred million dollars but it's going to fail yeah and it's going to fail because even if you drop the temperature the thing that killed the florida keys was not temperature the thing that killed the florida keys was basically the rape of the ecosystem you know, six million lobsters a year and all the fish you can catch and um, and everything else that you could take out of the system, plus all the sedimentation from all the dredging, plus the massive amount of nutrients that leaped out of septic tanks all up and down the Florida Keys. And then the massive amounts of excess nutrients that came down the spine through the Everglades and out Shark Slough and into Florida Bay. And, and that reared its head long before climate change was ever was ever even an issue. Um, there were some bleaching events. Um, there were a couple of times when it when it got really still and really hot and there were some reefs that bleached. But the other thing that really killed the Florida Keys was the loss of the sea urchins that were herbivores. So in 1983, 82, 83, 84, um, some disease went into the Caribbean and killed about 98% of the sea urchins. And it was like you went into a, a neighborhood and killed the lawnmowers and all the weeds started to grow. And then imagine you, that same neighborhood, you fly over it and you spray it with miracle Grow, 
and um, and all the weeds begin to grow and pretty soon all the plants overgrow everything and we've seen that and then we've also seen wave after wave after wave of disease when i when i worked in the florida keys in the mid 70s my first job out of grad school um i found a disease i called the white plague and the white plague has become the scourge of of the florida keys and elsewhere and there's a, a new version of it now they call stony coral tissue loss disease and it's taking out the last two or three percent that there's so few corals that people actually have gone into the florida keys and collected corals that are healthy and taken them to aquaria for safekeeping and so the environment is so polluted and so altered that the corals that live there can't live there that you got to put them in an aquarium for safekeeping if we don't go back and restore that environment and get rid of the various pollutants and get rid of the all the heavy metals and everything else you're not going to stand a chance yeah that's a that's a really big job <laughs> so with the remaining if is there any hope of um transplanting some of these corals to a, a an area that has cooler water temperatures and a and a less toxic uh environment that can save them that's not not in the lab but out well, in, in the real well, world hang on i beg to differ with you if <laughs> if we apply the appropriate green technology if we had the will to do that in florida we could clean up the water in florida if we had the will the political will to do it but we don't have the political will to do it it's not that we don't know what to do it's not that we don't know how to do it i mean you know the question before ng that we we're talking about do you really have to have, be a coral scientist to do something we know enough science right now to stop working doing science on corals and move into essentially environmental restoration we know how to do that, but nobody wants to because it costs money. And, and, a, and a basic example of that is the way houses are built that increases urban flooding. It's called slab on grade or fill and build. We go into areas, we take out all the topsoil, we take off all the trees, we fill it with a high clay content sand. We put a foundation that's just a little bit above the base flood elevation and we plant houses. And we basically made an impervious surface and all the chemicals that all the locals put on their lawns to make their lawns green and all of that stuff it all washes into the ocean or the everglades and, and in florida um it used to be that we thought the sugar growers and the cattle farmers were the major problem for pollution into the into florida bay because that's from lake okeechobee and down and so they got rid of that they, they really cleaned that up and that opened the way for a large number of gated communities with large lawns. And it started the process all over again. So we know how to do this if we want to, but we don't want to. We'd rather have a green lawn and a big SUV and blah, blah, blah. And um, money talks, nobody walks. But the technology is known. And, and coral scientists, we've been talking about this for 30 years. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, we do, we deal with some of that around the lakes and in, in the Sierra Nevada as well. Oh, um, Crater Lake breaks my heart. Lake Tahoe. Yeah. You know, um, those lakes are the clearest. They were the clearest natural waters in the world. Crater Lake is the clearest, had the clearest natural water in the world. You couldn't even make water that was as clear as that. I used to work at the visibility lab where we measured that. And now, no, they put a park and they put a, they, they, they put basically a, a, a toilet on the little island in the middle of it and then the lake started to turn green. Yeah, I'll also quickly add to, to what you were saying, Phil, and, and you touched on this just to sort of like put a, a point on it, put a head on it, is that the communities that are being most impacted by these issues often have the solutions and know the solutions and know what to do. Like, you know, people who are studying corals, people who are, are living there, who are, corals are part of their life know what the problem is and often know what the solution is and it's getting those communities resourced to solve those problems and getting money funded into those communities and getting education put into those communities and 
putting an emphasis on experiential knowledge as well as scientific knowledge to work those have those two things work together so that folks can can implement the solutions they know can work because you know if you come in from like you know let's say you live in alaska and you come to florida and you're like i have the answer you may have an answer but the people who are living there and who are up 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 close and personal with the issues often kind of know kind of know what's going on and know how they want to fix it and like you were saying phil the real issue is is the the political side of it and, and the funding side of it and prioritization and it, it feels like it's it's really hard to get people who live in washington and don't have a connection with the ocean to care enough to be like let's put a billion dollars into this project for an outcome that i can't really conceptualize that's a difficult thing and that's where again this is like my my favorite thing that no, you don't have to be a scientist to be a huge part of this and play a huge role in conservation because we need communicators, we need lawyers, we need politicians, we need organizers, we need teachers, we need everybody working together to bridge those problems, if that makes sense. And that's just kind of, I don't know, I, that, that excites me and I think there's a lot of hope in that. There's a wonderful science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson, and he wrote a book recently called Ministry for the Future. And it's about what happens when we decide we really have to make a difference. You know, what happens when we have these massive heat waves in India and these terrible storms and all of these problems and they just get to that point. And it's a, <clears throat> it's really a must read for anybody interested in climate science. Um, but back to my original, is there anywhere on the planet that we can put some of these corals that have been saved in the lab where they could grow again? Well, you, you would want to put them in the Caribbean. So you'd want to put them in parts of the Caribbean. And these diseases are being found Caribbean-wide. Mm. We think they're distributed in cruise ships, by cruise ships or by mm -hmm. um, bilge water. Yeah. So you find a few little pockets of, of, you know, sort of clean reefs. Like I know a few places in the Bahamas that are sort of on the, on the windward side of the Bahamas and they're getting water from directly from the Atlantic ocean, from the tropical Atlantic ocean. So you might be able to do that, but for the most part, unfortunately your answer is no. And a large part of that is because probably these are all related to human wastewater. And that brings up the idea of we're just got too many people on the planet. Yeah. That's the oh, thing that very few people want to talk about when we talk about <laughs> climate change for, for a number of political reasons, you know, the population bomb has that we right. don't talk about that anymore. No, and, no. Uh, Paul Ehrlich yeah. was a right. pretty impressive scientist. Um, I, I had one other question um, and this related to um, how long is the period um where coral um, go fluorescent um, before they die. Oh. And then I, I remember in the movie, they talked about how the coral can um, produce its own sunscreen sort of to protect itself. And is there any way that we can adapt that impulse to pr provide its own sunscreen uh, to last longer? Like, could it, could it um, start that mechanism earlier? So a, a coral is, is basically the ideal leaf. Corals sit there and they grow. And as they grow, they adapt their shape to collect as much light as possible. And the algae that are inside live in perfect places, just like the leaves on a tree are, are placed by the tree. You know, they grow by the tree, but it's stationary. So the coral is even better, a better leaf than a, than a tree is. It's a, it's a much better plant than a tree. And they make a variety of compounds. The UV compounds are, are made to protect the coral from UVA and UVB, which are hazardous. And they cause thymine dimers. And way back when, there used to be, before we had a, an atmosphere as thick as it, as it is now, the ozone layer wasn't as thick and we had a lot more UV. <clears throat> so there may be a, a, a long ancestral past of that. We needed that, that UV protection. And when the algae leave, you see that fluorescent there as the algae are leaving. Now, I don't know if they actually then begin to make more of that or it's just that you see it in the absence of the zooxanthellae. 
Okay. <clears throat> but either way, the coral will make as much of that as it possibly can. Obviously, there's very strong selection for that <clears throat> to, to make as much of that as it possibly can to protect itself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if it, it, in a way, it's sort of like, can we give it a vaccine? essentially <laughs> <clears throat> the answer really is not within a time period that makes any sense now if you think about it corals have have gone through all kinds of climate change before because oh 15,000 years ago sea level was about 160 meters below where it is today so that meant that there, there was an ice age right the ice was piled up on the continents <clears throat> and not in the ocean and that's gone on back and forth and back and forth and back and forth many times in the last 200 million years. But it's happened at a rate that the corals could begin to shift their evolutionary um, mechanisms. You know, they can begin to, to adapt. Right. And what you're seeing now is a climate changing, what, a thousand times faster or 10,000 times faster than imaginable. And so this, the, the evolutionary process is just not fast enough. Yeah, it's nope. um, a thank you guys. This has been a really interesting conversation and it's just such a heartbreaking, sure. you know, epidemic. Oh, believe me. I mean, where, where I work in Raja Ampat, which is crazy, there are corals that live very shallow when, when we get these spring tides and the water level goes way down at the low tide. They sit exposed to the tropical sun for hours. I've measured 42 degrees Celsius where they are. So they're sitting there baking. The uh, water comes back and they're fine. Mm. So why can't we have those everywhere? Well, they do in those sorts of places. And Steve Palumbi has shown that that happens in Samoa. And <clears throat> where you see that kind of habitat, you see that kind of evolution. You see those kinds of adaptations occurring. Mm. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank and thank you, Amanda. And those questions were amazing. Like, I mean, we learned so much just from your questions. So I appreciate you so much for asking them because it's just it takes everybody's perspective to really pull everything together. So thank you so much. Um, and next, we're gonna have uh, Rachel joining us, who studies microplastics. Um, so, Rachel, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself briefly and. Go ahead and ask your questions. So you had some really good ones, so welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, it's it's great to be here. It's a great opportunity to just uh, have a good conversation about um, important things happening in the oceans. I'm a PhD student in microplastics. I work mostly in freshwater systems, but I'm also working obviously in systems that are connected to the ocean. And we see a lot of the impact of the pollutants that we're monitoring as they move out into the ocean. Um, I, I think my first question that I wanted to ask was, um, and we've talked a lot about adaptation and the lack thereof, uh, with the corals and what the future might look like. Um, I was thinking about how our reef systems might change with a uh, loss of certain coral species and maybe a retention of others, or maybe, um, mm -hmm some species moving in that were more adapted from different environments. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on what like that restructuring or adaptation might look like in some areas and, and whether or not the reefs could retain their same or not the same, but similar ecological functions um, even after being, uh, you know, losing some of the diversity um, that they have with, with the multitude of species that are there. Yeah. Well, the first thing is they become more simple. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and they become more weedy. Um, just like on land, there are, there are plants that we would think of as like, you know, old growth case selected, you know, the oak trees of the environment. <clears throat> and then there are other places where we think of, um, we see lots of weeds in a field. And, mm -hmm. and what happens on the reef is, there are successional changes. And the first things that, that begin to die are some of the older, larger, more signature kinds of corals. The, um, the Acroporos, 
in, in the Pacific, we call them Acroporas. In the Caribbean, we call them Acropora. <coughs> but we see the, the, the Acroporas dying out and they become replaced by other species of more are selected, more early colonizers. So the reef essentially goes back under an earlier stage of successional, an earlier successional stage. <clears throat> the other thing we see is they shift more towards becoming algal meadows than they do, um, than they are coral reefs. So they become simplified and become overgrown with algae and they become algal turfs. <clears throat> and that's due in part to a loss of grazers and an increase in nutrients. So a uh, company accompanying with that question, um, is it the loss of the species that's creating those algal meadows or spreading that um, type of uh, simplified habitat? Or is it the coral that's being lost that's making those species go away or chicken or the egg sort of question? Um, all right, I'll, I'll start it off in Great South Bay in the 1950s, <clears throat> there was, was a, a wonderful shellfish industry. There were people out there all the time. I, mean, I, I grew up on Great South Bay and they were always out there clamming and <clears throat> Blue Point oysters and stuff were amazing. And then they started the Long Island duck farms. And the phosphate from the duck farm fostered the growth of blue-green algal phytoplankton rather than diatoms. <clears throat> and they, Basically, all the clams and oysters and shellfish died with their guts full because they couldn't digest the blue-green algae. Okay, <clears throat> so algae grab nutrients faster than corals can. Mm -hmm. Algae also grow faster and they're more prolific. When the diadema died, when the sea urchins died in the Caribbean, the algae instantly began to grow on all the surfaces that were being cleaned every night by the diadema. So imagine you had somebody out there every single night clipping the the uh, the weeds away from your from your beautiful garden, and that was that's a very important part. We didn't we didn't have modern coral reefs until fish evolved. <clears throat> so we didn't have modern coral reefs until we had herbivores, and when the herbivores are lost, the algae grow in, and when you fertilize it more, you get more algae, and you get Blue greens, typically lingvia, which is a, a real filamentous sort of frilly blue green, <clears throat> is one of the first creatures to grow in there when you excess nutrients. And it will just grow on top of gorgonians and sponges, and it'll just sit and grow on top of everything. Any place it can find a little hold fast place to colonize, and it begins to grow, and then it smothers it, and it just sort of overwhelms the whole thing. So in your mind, is the is it a, I know it's hard to pick, uh, which one is the bigger problem here, but um, is the problem with wastewater management and nutrification in these systems uh, the crux point? Or um, is it the temperature change? Or is there one we can handle easier than the other? Well, I would say it's the increase in nutrients and other pollutants, the, all the endocrine um, disruptors. Mm -hmm. You know, like sunscreen, everybody poo poos sunscreen, but parts per billion uh, <laughs> will affect larval settlement. <clears throat> um, Igarol, which is a compound in tributyl tin bottom paint, a couple parts per billion, and it affects larval settlement. So you, you chip away at the reproductive side, and then you overgrow the adults with algae, and they don't have they don't have the resilience. But I said before, if, if corals have excess nutrients. The algae think it's like crack cocaine and they grow crazy because they've evolved in a system that has no nutrients. You know, the, the we think of forest recycling in a forest with the leaves falling and the root mat and now the, the mycorrhizal fungi. Well, mm -hmm. imagine that all being compressed into one little creature we call a coral with its algae and its microbiome. And, and then you begin to disrupt that. So you take 200 million years of evolution in the tropical ocean, and then you start pouring all these sort of disruptors on it, mainly fertilizers. And, um, and, and that's a serious problem, you know? Yeah. We also have, I mean, we have this massive amount of sargassum growing in the Atlantic Ocean right now. There's um, tourist beaches get overwhelmed. They'll have 
two, three, four feet of sargassum just blowing up on the on the coastline. And it's over nutrification of the Atlantic Ocean from mm. the population in the Atlantic Ocean, in the uh, Amazon, <clears throat> Manaus and the other overpopulation along the Amazon, and also along the northeast coast of America. Now, we know how to stop all of that. If you want to, it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, we know how to do it. My friends that built the biosphere, too, figured out how to recycle all their waste and turn it into food. And, and we've known how to do that for a long time. And a lot of indigenous cultures do that intuitively, you know. <clears throat> um, but I, I, would, I would add that a lot of indigenous cultures um, also were small people and they were small groups of hunter-gatherers so that disruption wasn't as great. And the Hawaiians, for all their for all we give them credit for, also practiced infanticide. So they kept their populations down. So, you know, I mean, they were wise. They understood that. Um, maybe birth control would have been a, a more appropriate method, but they didn't have that. But I, I, I speak out of turn. I don't want to offend anybody. But those sorts of things, the, the populations adapt, have adapted to that. But now we're seeing this massive increase in people which has this massive food supply system and industrial food, and it goes on and on and on, just a cascade. Um, and what we need to do is turn away from dollars and figure out what's really important because every dollar you spend is a vote on how you want the world to be. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've got, I've got one more question, but uh, it'll be a little okay. bit in a different direction. Is that okay, Jen? Yeah, go ahead. We still have some time. Go. All right, great. Well, so I loved the uh, communication and outreach focus of Jason Coral, um, especially with a lot of the big problems that we're facing, which we've talked about. A, um, it can be really overwhelming and daunting. Uh, people just uh, feel like they can't make a difference. But I'm wondering, since it's been five years or so since the film was released, um, how how do you feel about the outreach and communication that came out of the project? And um, what do you feel like was the most successful uh, from a science communication and, and getting people to understand the problem and be willing to take action? What did you feel like was the most successful aspect of that? Wow. Um, you know, when we were at Sundance, when Chasing Coral premiered, we got a, about a three-minute standing ovation. People were crying. People were hugging us. People were giving us little mementos. Um, and I said to Jeff, I said, you know, um, you've given the oceans a voice. We haven't had one since Captain Cousteau passed away. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that whole idea of we're going to show people how wonderful and how alive the ocean is, and people are going to love it and save it, that idea hasn't worked. Chasing Coral's taken a different approach, and, and I'll let MG talk about it more, but going in and getting kids and teaching kids and trying to get into that sort of lower level because they understand what's going on. You know, they're really bright. Kids, I, I always say children are really smart until we make them stupid. <laughs> so MG, take it away. Yeah, um, I mean, you said it perfectly. I also will say that I joined the team about two and a half years ago. So I wasn't actually here for the release of Chasing Coral, but the reason I, and, and stick with me, this is pertinent, but the, the reason I'm even here is because I was taking an ecology class and a science communication class, because that's what I ended up studying. Um, and we, our homework was to watch Chasing Coral. So I watched the film, I was, you know, weeping five minutes in. I, I furiously wrote an email to the inbox. It was like, what can I do? I'm so overwhelmed. Um, and they got back to me and were like, I, that's a great question and sent me some recommendations. And I got in contact with Zach and talked to him for a while and just got inspired. And then later on there came an internship and it turned into a job. And my entire career is just because of this film essentially, wow. which is like, I didn't make the film so I can say that, but it's true. And <laughs> it changed my life. So I, I feel very passionately, like you were saying, um, <laughs> about the outreach and the communication, how crucial that is. And um it's you know it's screened 
over 3000 times on almost every continent. It's been all over the world. Um, so many people have been reached. I get emails still today, like almost every day, at least a couple of emails from people all over the world saying, I had no idea. This was, this was, I didn't know this was happening. It's again, the out of sight, out of mind type of thing. And I think just starting a conversation that otherwise wouldn't have a catalyst to begin so easily. It's sort of like an on-ramp to the climate conversation. Um, I think that's been a huge impact. Again, going into communities, we went into um, we went into communities in Colorado, which is where I live now, um, and we had a campaign called Chasing Brews, which is where we went to breweries and screened the film. And breweries are kind of like you know a trusted neutral zone. You have your favorite local spot you go to. It's like a coffee shop or your favorite restaurant, and it's a place you go. You trust the people who work there. You trust your friends. You hang out there and really leaning into trusted messengers to be folks to talk to their communities about what's going on. Because again, like I was saying earlier, you can have someone come in from somewhere else and tell you what's going on, or you can have people who are already a part of your life come in and be like, this is something that's happening. Let's all talk about this together, which is, this is exactly what we're doing here now at this event is like bringing folks together to talk about this and start a conversation because it does a lot of times feel like, and I have certainly fallen into those thought patterns of like, it's just too big. It's just too big of a problem. What am I going to do? Um, especially in college, it would get to me all the time, as I'm sure you understand getting your PhD in something like this. It's huge. But I think that we have found that people are really powerful, especially when we work together, um, which is cheesy, but it's cheesy because it's true. Um, and, and we've done so many things like um, Jim Porter went to, to Capitol Hill and screened the film. Um, right before they were having an ocean acidification hearing. And when he did so, he waited until after school and he had the kids of the folks who were working on the Hill come watch the film. Um, and he was told, or someone was told afterwards that the aide let him know that the kids on the way home were like, mom, dad, why aren't you fixing this problem? Like you're in the government, solve it. You know, like that sort of thing. As you were saying, Phil, kids know, they know what's going on. We don't give them enough credit for how smart they are and how intuitive they can be. Um, with problems. And I compl I love what you said that kids are smart until we make them dumb. But yeah, it's absolutely true. When you when you feel strongly about something, lean into that feeling and start to follow your gut to do something about it. And something as simple as a conversation can have a huge impact. Um, and I think that's something that I'm really proud of to work with this campaign and work at this company that there's been a lot of conversations facilitated. And it's also been used time and time again. We have a program called Film in the Field where um, folks can register to use. Uh, I think we have six films and we have an agreement with the filmmakers and also two of them are our films so we can you know do as we please but um and they can show them to their communities and we give fundraising for them to have events and facilitate conversations and sort of start the impact in that way so just bringing the film into different communities even people again who already know the problem climate change is a household phrase it's a household conversation and people have opinions on it whether or not they've you know read too much about it or know too much about it so having something that's an easy piece to be like watch this movie or watch this educational clip or go to this website and read about it is just sort of like the jumping off point for a lot of incredible work and the support point for a lot of incredible work that's already being done and has been being done for decades. Um, so we also really especially recently since the campaign is sort of wound down since the film is now um, over five years old, um, being a tool for organizers, for people who are already doing work on the ground, for folks who are most impacted and have been working in climate change for, you know, forever, much longer than I have, um, as a capacity building tool for them to be able to be like, look at this, let's have a conversation, let's use this as a tool to shift the conversation where we want it to go. Um, we're really proud of being able to to fill that gap too. I could keep rambling, but I'll stop. <laughs> you know, another piece of this is, it's like people don't really worry about flooding until they do. People don't really worry about climate change until their house is washed away. And people are like, you know, oh, my God, my house got blown away by this storm. The storm surge that came through was so massive, it wiped out a whole section of the coastline. And storms have been doing that a lot in other parts of the world. And now it's, it's happening here. And they're getting bigger and they're getting more. And this is not going to stop. So eventually the economic system is going to say, you know, time out. We, we can't afford to insure your house. If you want to build a house on the beach, and this is what my mom used to say when I grew up on Long Island, my mother would say, you can't afford to have a house on the beach unless you can afford to lose it. Mm -hmm. And then we had legislation that came in with the, um, with the um, insurance. So we had subsidized insurance and everybody started building houses and there was housing boom and everybody lived in coastal areas and flooding areas. And I think I have insurance. A lot of those people that have FEMA flood insurance 
it's going to pay a tiny little piece if they're lucky of that house. So as more of this happens, maybe more people will listen. Maybe more people will begin to get engaged and do something about it because it's fixable. It's going to take a long time. It take 125 years or more to flush all the carbon out of the atmosphere. So if you want to reverse this, it's going to take time, <clears throat> but it's something that has to be done or humanity is going to get destroyed. And, th and then the earth will heal itself. Get us out of the way first if it needs true. to. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it's true. <laughs> One day. <laughs> read, read Ministry for the Future. And the thing that's going to kill more people is heat. We're going to see these heat waves like we've been seeing throughout. I mean, what was it, 116 degrees in Oregon? Um, and, and we had these massive heat waves in India. And 15 years ago, we had a massive heat wave that went through Paris in the summertime and killed 10,000 uh, people. So yeah, the the, they, they, they had the metal roofs, though. So that didn't that like metal schmetal, whatever it is. I mean, <laughs> you can I, 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 I was told as a teacher, I was like, well, it's because they had the metal roofs. So <laughs> yeah, there were also heat waves this summer in in uh, in Spain, all over Europe, Spain, Italy. In Spain, I know hundreds of people died well, from heat waves this like, year. Right. Yeah, England had a crazy heat wave this summer, mm -hmm. too. So, yeah. It's now. Yeah. It's happening now. Right. So, and and that's how um, Ministry for the Future starts. But you're going to see that more and more and more. And, and you're going to see the ability to cope with it. Oh, we're going to turn on the air conditioning. Well, there's no electricity. Hmm. Happened in California. The grid couldn't handle it this summer. Exactly. Texas had an issue last year. I mean, it's just... It's <clears throat> right. So, well, thank you so much, Rachel. Like, I appreciate you so much for coming on. Your your work's amazing too. So we'll be featuring Rachel later on um, <laughs> with her amazing microplastic research. So cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have uh, um, Thanks, Rachel. Yes. So we have one more panelist, and then I have a couple of questions from a teacher and one of our prior research students. So we have a couple more. But if you do want to ask our panelists any questions please put them in the comments so that i can make sure that we get you amplified and get your questions answered so next we're going to introduce sean um he is going to introduce himself briefly and ask you guys a question so go ahead sean okay can you guys hear me all right my yes. says i'm unmuted okay excellent uh it's always you know phil it's always a pleasure to to chat with you um and get to pick your brain. But uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Sean Wesley. I work at University of Florida and I'm part of Whitney Marine Lab. Uh, and I'm a coastal wetland person. So I do try to dabble a little bit in coral reefs, but not quite to the extent uh, as what you guys are doing. So I'm working on getting at that point, right? Um, but my, my biggest question for you, since you've been and seen a lot more of these habitats and these systems, um, with the loss of the corals on these coastal ecotones, or uh, for those watching, that's kind of the edge piece, right, of these coral uh, systems, uh, do you see changes in the species presence as far as like the coastline? So like I'm kind of thinking because of my work and what I do, looking at the flora and even within the biota changes. And then like we had chatted before, my, my biggest thing is taking that biogeochemistry process, right? And looking at biota behavior um, or the behavior of the ecosystem. But ultimately, do you see, you know, kind of a change in the flora structure and, and even within the biota uh, structure in that habitat as far as what's there, who's doing what kind of a, a, a thing. Well, if, if there's nutrification going on, you get an overgrowth of algae and you end up with an algal mat and that algal rug, so to speak, because <clears throat> it's a multi-species community. It, it's kind of like an algal rug, you know, a couple centimeters thick, sometimes two or three or more. But you get all kinds of different amphipods and sponges and all kinds of different organisms colonizing that. Um, so, you, so you'll see that sort of a shift. You'll see a, a change in the fish. And <clears throat> what we found with fish, my work in Bali, as, as the reef collapsed um, in Northwest Bali, what we saw was that corals, if, if you have more structure, you have more fish but you don't necessarily have more diversity because the, the fish diversity is correlated with the coral diversity. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing as on land, 
if we have native trees, we have native insects, we have more birds. If we start to plant all kinds of exotic plants, all kinds of exotic trees, they don't attract the same kinds of insects and you don't have as many birds. Okay. And, and and that's well known now. I mean that's right. that's something that's going. That's why when you that's why people are now going back to let's let's have um, a native plant society and plant native plants because it has native insects and then you have the native birds and and it it follows. So as the system becomes simplified through the loss of of species diversity, say of the trees or species diversity of the corals, what you're going to find is fewer fish. And then from a biogeochemical standpoint, you'll find a, a shift because <clears throat> the, the processing of all those nutrients is different. Now, when you add lionfish to the mix, what the lionfish are doing is basically short-circuiting the carbon cycle because <clears throat> the lionfish are eating all the small animals that normally feed on a lot of the, um, the, the coanocytes that sponges slough off. And so sponges um, are constantly sloughing off cells because they're, they're using the cells to, to filter all the time. And that's fed upon by all the little small invertebrates. And then they're fed upon by the small fish. And the small fish are fed upon by the bigger fish or the little fish grow up to be a big fish. <clears throat> and the lionfish are feeding on all the little small invertebrates they can as well as the baby fish. So you have an introduced species that is short-circuiting the bio, the biogeochemistry of the system. It's awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it leads me to to question whether or not do we have, you know, as like a coastal flora change, right? Like here at Whitney, right? I'm working firsthand watching mangroves take over, uh, you know, our salt marsh systems, and so that. Yeah right that changes your chemistry that changes your biota that changes all kinds of things present and as we go forward with looking at restoration right that's kind of the way i want to take this type of thing and, and just kind of build this idea is are we really looking at it at a landscape scale versus just that single habitat scale and i'm curious as to like i say just since you guys had cameras in the field how much of that you could see change so so I think what you'll see along the coast of Florida as warming continues is mangroves will move north. I think that that's sort of a product of, of heat, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> We're not going to see that here because it gets cold in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I said before, that the tropics have some sort of boundary. There's, there's some boundary there that, that is, you know, this temperate thing we call winter that comes into it. Um, so there, there may be a thermal boundary on the other side that keeps that from growing. But as you change the vegetation, you're absolutely right. You're going to change the various biogeochemical processing. And this is something that's happened over and over and over all through time. But the other issue is when we have built structures like seawalls <clears throat> and the mangroves try to grow next to them, well, they might have a better chance than, um, than say, uh, the seagrass. The Spartina, yeah. <laughs> yeah, then, then Spartina. But at the same time, there's that problem. And, and we have that problem here because they're, they're going to grow inland as sea level comes up and all of a sudden they're going to hit firm property that people own. And those people are not, no way, no how are they going to, you know, give up their property until a hurricane takes it away. And then the question is, <clears throat> can you rebuild? And I, I think you'll see some legal aspect about that. In, in the future, you know, yeah, but I, I already I, seeing some of that. Too. Yeah, I, I think you see a lot of it in South Florida. Yeah. But I, I think these these migrations of vegetation on a landscape scale, as you say, you know, um, it's going to be a problem. We, we have an oyster restoration project here where they take oysters and they put oyster shells from restaurants in sort of net bags and they nail them down in places okay. and they stop the sediment and they they help stabilize the shoreline but you can only do so much of that you can't really you know do that in a large area unless you want to spend billions of dollars um new york is building oyster reefs which i think is pretty interesting they're using them for breakwaters um there's a lot of that sort of biomimetic stuff 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're we're doing some of that as well. So yeah. yeah, but it's 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 just the sort of the I guess you'd say the 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 the, the peak of hubris or something like that to say we can do this, we can restore this. Right. You know, we talk about we're going to restore the Florida Keys. The diving industry already figured out a way to save the diving industry, and that's plant wrecks down the reef and take people wreck diving instead of reef diving. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. All right. So I have two questions. So I had a prior research experience student that did a full investigation on her own, but she wanted to know about climate change a little bit. So I'm going to read her question for her because she could not be here tonight, unfortunately. Um, so her question is, what do you think the solution would be to address problems such as inequity and the denial of climate change? And I know that's a little bit of a loaded question, but that is what you MG, want. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> this is your time. Oh, man. All right. Time to solve the world's toughest problem. Uh, yes. Um, no, no. It's a really good question because it's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a huge problem. No, I think... Um, so just so I'm remembering it, she was asking what the the best way to solve the inequity due to climate change and the like sort of communication and side of it. And the denial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's okay. what we like to talk about because we Yeah, no. Science, but I mean it's a thing that we have to deal you know, with. No, it's it's important to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean yeah, because yeah. if we don't if we don't talk about it, people are gonna think that everyone believes in climate change and it's no, it's, it's easy to get into your own bubble. And be like, well, all of my friends know that climate change is real. So what do you mean people don't believe in it? And there are absolutely yeah. people who don't. We all know that. I mean, especially the three of us, we all know that. that um, I and think I think it's just the nature of science in general. It's it's something that people are studying this and we have the data, but there's an outside bubble, do you know, so right. how can we communicate that to others? Yes, totally. So I think what, what you just said, communication is a huge part of it because humans are just inherently self-interested. We always have been and we always will be. And that's one of the things that's gotten us into this problem. Um, and even, you know, the most altruistic person still relates more to an issue if it's personalized to them. So one of the hardest things is, like, like I've said a couple of times, is getting folks who live nowhere near an ocean and don't, let's say they don't eat fish, they don't, you know, in their minds rely on the ocean for anything why should I care is sort of the mentality and sort of, I think where some of the denial comes in that it's like, maybe it does exist, but I don't really care. And I'm just going to kind of deny it. And I think some you've touched on a couple of times here, Phil, is that um, the climate has changed before because that's a huge, a huge argument that people have. And they're like, well, you know, this has happened before. So this is natural. And this is just whatever. There was a politician who brought a snowball into Congress because it snowed somewhere. And he's like, how could there, how could global warming be real? It's snowing. And that's just not how it works. And that's, that's kind of why education is so important and conversations are so important. So there's an emphasis when um, when asked about what the impacts of chasing coral were and um, what we were sort of most proud of. I think the, the facilitating conversations piece is what I'm really proud of and proud to be a part of because getting folks to understand sort of the nuance of climate change because that the, the language global warming can be dangerous because then it, you know, has folks believing that if it's snowing or if it's cold outside that, that global warming isn't real. Um, but getting people to understand the nuance of the situation that like climate change is not just weather change. Climate is made up of a bunch of little weathers. I had a professor tell me that in college and it's kind of like stuck with me because it's very true. And I like that visual. Um, but it, it's not like, you know, we're not going to have winter anymore in yeah. Colorado because the climate's changing. We're going to have winter. It's just going to be different and the seasons are going to be different and the things that are being impacted are different. So, and you know, I could launch into my whole soapbox about that because communications is kind of my, my favorite thing. But to answer that part of her question, I think that having facts, but also having empathy is a really big part of the climate conversation and getting folks on board who aren't on board already. Because I think the people who are, are, you know, I don't, I don't like this, this phrase, but I'm struggling to think of a better one. The folks who are an easy target to get into the climate change conversation are already in it. You know, like if, if you're, if you believe it and you're, you're a science-based person and you're someone who you're in it because you care about the people who are being impacted, you love the animals, you love the ecosystems, you love plants, what have you. If you're in it already, you're in it already. So the folks that we're trying to get to now are people who 
don't believe in it for whatever reason and have found reasons to deny or not care about the, the science and the logic. And so I, brought, I bring up empathy because understanding where people come from and why they have reason to deny that is a big part of it because you're not going to get people on board by just, you know, yelling or, or throwing numbers at folks. You have to personalize it and you have to say, well, this is how it's going to impact you. This is how it's going to impact your family. Let's say I'm from Alabama. So there's a lot of climate denial there and talking to folks who live there and, and people that I grew up with, they may not believe in it. They may not think it matters. But when you say, hey, the weather patterns are going to change and that's going to impact, you know, it can impact your fishing. It can impact your hunting. And that's a big part of your family. and That's a big part of your culture. Then you can get people to care. If you personalizing the message, I think I have found to be really effective. And there are people who do it all kinds of different ways. Um, but as far as denial I think empathy and communication and persistence too are are huge, huge well, roles in that. Yeah, I, I, I'd also like to add to that. That's on a personal level, but our corporate structure and our capitalist structure means that we have this responsibility to the shareholder and we have to have improved profits every year and we have to increase the share price every year. And we've lost sight of, things that are more valuable than money. And, you know, it's just like the cigarette issue and, um, and, and cancer. We now have all, we know that, for example, ExxonMobil had, they were collecting data years ago that demonstrated what was happening. <clears throat> they knew all about it. Um, you know, it just goes on and on and on. And so we, we do need some, good legislation. I, I, I think what's going to happen is the deniers are going to be proven wrong by the climate. I think there are going to be, you know, more tornadoes, more storms, more, more outages. And, and climate change is really more extremes. When, when you increase the temperature of the atmosphere, it holds more water. <clears throat> and when water changes state, it releases a lot of energy. And that's what we're seeing. You know, we're going to see bigger storms, bigger this, bigger that, more of this, more of that. And um, and it's going to drive us into the environmental the, the issues about environmental security. And, and by the way, the, the armed forces are working 24-7 to deal with climate change. Because <clears throat> not only do we have bases going underwater, we have all kinds of other issues about how the security of the world is going to change, how all these problems are changing. You know, Syria, the whole revolution in Syria was a result of, of famine caused by drought. And the farmers came into town and said, hey, we have a problem. And that started the revolution. And then Assad just decided to wipe them all out. But we have these big problems going on that are climate. So I think it's, it's going to raise it. But also teaching our kids that science is a way of knowing it's not some sort of yeah. voodoo magic and opinion. It's right. It's how you find out about the world. <clears throat> and without that, you know, it's, it's, it's not nearly as wonderful. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I think that's why stuff like this is so important because yes, like all, you can, it's okay to have these questions, like to, to question things that are going on around you. And if you don't believe something like, but look at the data, look at the things that are going on and actually do that research and find your own results from that based on what's actually out there. And totally, the climate, the climate data is so prevalent right now. There's so much out there. Um, and I, I really do think that, and I hope that the people watching understand that these are things that you can actually look at. Like well, it's all of yeah, them. Totally. But there's yeah. a reason there's a reason we have what's called peer-reviewed research because exactly. when you yeah. <laughs> do your research now, you can go out on, on, on the web, on the World Wide Web, and you can find anything you want. You can find any kind of, <laughs> of lie, mistruth, whatever yeah. you want. It's there. So and that's why go to Google Scholar and start looking at the peer-reviewed research. You know, what Absolutely. what has the science community produced and, and where do we yeah. go? And, and of course, we never really know exactly what's happening, right? I mean, Albert Einstein once said, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research. <laughs> yeah, so, no, that's so true. Yeah, I, I have so a little that, Albert. That, that peer here. reviewed and these opportunities for the kids to actually see the things that are going on is just absolutely incredible. Because we didn't have that as kids. Like, I, if I had that as a well, student, no. 
like you got like if we had <laughs> we all be in a different spot right now like the opportunities are endless right now for our students to really look at what's going on and have mm -hmm. those peer reviewed papers and I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. So I, I, I don't want to cut this short, but I have one more question. Like, I don't want to, that's a good conversation. I have one more question for almost at an hour and a half. So I have one oh, for, for teachers who's just phenomenal. So Elise, you're so great. And she did a full climate change study with us. And she had a question with, from her kids. And I want to make sure we get it answered because we're really cutting close on time. So she said... <laughs> I've heard about research being done on coral found in extreme environments. So it's a different topic. Um, are there corals that might be adapted to, to survive increasingly warm oceans, which is a really great evolution question. So <clears throat> there are corals that live in the bottom of the sea where it's dark and cold. And there are corals that live in very warm places like on the island of Ofu and American Samoa in the intertidal and the corals I talked about in Raja Ampat that get they get exposed to the bright tropical sun for four, five, six hours a day sometimes. And um, and yes, there are corals that can survive those extremes. And what will happen is it gets warmer is the corals that can't will die off and the ones that can will reproduce more. And so that's what we call evolution by natural selection. And that takes a long time. Mm -hmm. The, the other issue is with ocean acidification, it becomes more difficult to calcify. And so, and, and, and that's simply a matter of, of um, I guess you'd say physics. It, it's more difficult to deposit the calcium carbonate crystals. And again, if you have algae that can work against that, they, they have the, their biological pump. And there have been times in the past, you know, 50, 60 million years ago, um, when CO2 levels were higher. So there's been time when we've had increased CO2 and um, corals will work out. They'll work it out. What I think is going to happen is if we keep going in the way we're going as business as usual, it's the humans that are going to get wiped out. And the corals will mm -hmm. be here fine. You know, 10 million years after we're gone, the corals will have a resurgent, resurgent and they'll be happy. <clears throat> and what we ought to be really looking at is saying, you know, this is like the canary in a cage that the miners take down in their mine. And we need to pay attention to this because nature's saying, hey, guys, listen to this. Pay attention. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. And then you've brought this up a couple of times, Phil, that the the climate's changed before. It's happened It's happened before. And like it, over geological time period, there's been ice ages. You know, there's been different levels of carbon in the atmosphere. There's been all different types of atmospheres. But the difference is that it, it's something people like to say, well, you know, this has happened before, like I said a minute ago, but it doesn't happen this fast. It, it may happen, you know, quickly over a geological period, but we're talking, you know, thousands of years. We're not <laughs> talking 50 or 60 or even 100. Like there's not time for adaptation. There's not time for evolution. So some of the questions about like, will the corals evolve to catch up? Like you said, yeah, they will, but we won't because we don't have the time. Like it's happening so much faster than it does naturally. So the argument of, well, climate change has happened before is moot in that way because it's happened, but it has not happened like this. Well said. Yeah, absolutely well said. And and like I say, when the temperature starts to get hot enough to kill people, um, that's what's going to happen. And and right. these crazy little hot spots that we don't understand, like Oregon, <clears throat> you know, what, one of the first ones we saw was um, over um, the Phoenix Islands, um, Kiribati. And we saw... The, the, um, the temperature in the lagoon got up to something like 34 degrees Celsius. And it was like God was up on up in the atmosphere with a magnifying glass, just sort of burning a hole in, in, the, uh, in the ocean, sort of like, you know, a kid killing ants with a magnifying glass. And these hotspots sort of came and went along the equatorial region. And we didn't really understand it, but we could observe them. And now they're happening in places you'd never imagined like Eugene, Oregon, and, and you know, um, in Texas, and India, and China, and on and on and on. Yeah. All right. Well, I just want to thank you both so much for joining us today. This was awesome. We learned so much about climate change and corals and 
I just appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Chasing Coral was such an important film for myself. Um, watching that, I mean, I just, my daughter did a whole, she's been on year three of doing climate change studies just because of your film. So yeah. oh, she very, sounds awesome. Yeah. She, but she's <laughs> Ocean acidification research with uh, diatoms this year, just to look at oh, what's cool. going on that level. And so you guys are making such a huge impact, and we just so much appreciate you um, for joining us today. Um, so if you guys would like to learn more about what Headwater Science Institute does, you can visit us online. You can also email myself at jenwater at uh, headwaterscienceinstitute.org. Um, we also have our back to school fundraiser going on, which I'm streaming at the bottom here. We are trying to raise money to bring programs, um, especially things like climate change to schools around the country. So if you want to help out, you can go ahead and donate to us. But if you have any questions, please email me at jen at headwaterscienceinstitute.org. So thank you again. And we just so much appreciate uh, Chasing Coral for helping us today. It's such an important film and if you at minimum listen to the soundtrack like it it will get you in the heartstrings like it's beautiful so thank you everybody and have a good night